afternoon and welcome. I am Emilio Pantojas, director of the Institute of Caribbean Studies. And today we have the final lecture in the Caribbean lecture series. Uh, today we have a very special guest, uh, a special scholar who has been with us during this year at the Institute of Caribbean Studies. He's been a scholar in residence from the Ford Foundation. His name is Dr. Alberto Ortiz Diaz. He was born and raised in the Puerto Rican diaspora between Southern New Jersey and North Philadelphia. This academic year, as I said, he is a Ford Foundation postdoctoral fellow based at the Institute of Caribbean Studies of the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras Campus. He earned his PhD at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, where he worked principally with historian Francisco Scarano Fiol, a good colleague and friend of ours. And he's an assistant professor now on global health studies and history at the University of Iowa. This fall, he will begin a new academic appointment in the Department of History at the University of Texas Arlington, where he will offer undergraduate and graduate courses on the histories of medicine, science and technology, Latin America and the Caribbean, Caribbean Atlantic. His research has been supported by the University of Wisconsin at Madison, the Ford Foundation, and now more recently, the American Philosophical Society. He is author of the essay, Pathologizing the Hebrew, Mental and Social Health in Puerto Rico, Oso Blanco, 1930s to 1950s. And this appeared in the Americas, uh, volume 77, number three of 2020 and is currently completing a book entitled Raising the Living Dead, Rehabilitative Corrections in Puerto Rico and the Caribbean, a study about intersections of medicine and belief inside and beyond mid 20th century Caribbean carceral institutions. His talk today is an overview on his book, Book in Progress, uh, which is currently under review by an academic press. The talk will shed light on the race and raise key questions about the period immediately preceding the rise of mass, inc the rise of mass incarceration and the punitive turn in carceral studies. Without further ado, I leave you Professor Alberto Ortiz Diaz. Thank you, Professor. Uh, muchas gracias, Emilio. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen right fast. And I believe uh, it should be visible to everyone. Um, again, muchas gracias, Emilio, uh, Juan Astacio, and others uh, on the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras campus, Juan Guti Cordero, uh, Humberto Garcia Muñiz, uh, Jamari Duo Gonzalez, Javier Almeida Lucil, uh, colleagues at the General Archive, Pedro Roy Alvarado, Jose Charon. I could go on uh, talking about this Frank caring community of people who have made my time in Puerto Rico well worth it, despite the limits associated with the pandemic, of course. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and jump right into this talk. Uh, as you can see on this first slide, it's, uh, it's entitled Raising the Living Dead, Rehabilitative Corrections uh, in Puerto Rico and the Caribbean. Uh, and in due course, uh, we'll touch on all the major aspects of this title, uh, hopefully within 40, 45 minutes or so. Uh, first, uh, let's begin with a snapshot, obviously, uh, of the Caribbean, uh, this University of Texas uh, map uh, that I found online, uh, and it showcases, right, for many of us, what we already know, uh, the circum-Caribbean world, and that the, Car the Caribbean has Caribbean uh, coasts that uh, touch Central America, South America, uh, Southeastern United States. Uh, for the purposes of the talk today, uh, I will zoom in uh, on the case of Puerto Rico. Uh, I should note, however, that uh, I'm very interested in more thoroughly integrating uh, the Caribbean facing dimensions right into my work, particularly in Cuba, the Dominican Republic, uh, as well as other corners of the Caribbean. So for those of you who are attending, um, I'm a big believer in sort of the communal production of history. Uh, so I, I encourage your comments, your recommendations, your literature references, in addition to your questions. Um, since most of the talk will, will be about Puerto Rico, 
and I will gesture toward the broader Caribbean uh, as well. Uh, so here's a CIA map of Puerto Rico, and today I'll talk mostly about that gray area in the northeastern part of Puerto Rico, uh, the San Juan metropolitan area as we know it today, and nestled between San Juan, Guaynabo, Trujillo Alto, Carolina, Rio Piedras, which is the site of uh, the Insular Penitentiary, uh, also known as Oso Blanco, uh, which is the focus of the book in progress. Uh, Puerto Rico's an archipelago, and also during the years that uh, I study, the middle decades of the 20th century, also consisted of a carceral archipelago. So we have an example of archipelagos within archipelagos. Uh, so I look at Oso Blanco, but I also consider the district prisons uh, in San Juan, Arecibo, Aguadilla, Mayagüez, Ponce, Guayama, and Humacao. Uh, I consider the women's industrial prison uh, on the north central coast en route to Arecibo. Uh, I consider the uh, reform school for youths or the industrial school in Mayagüez. I consider penal encampments uh, in Calle, Rio Grande, and Mayagüez. So the story is really a story about right uh, Puerto Rico's carceral archipelago, even though I focus on the insular penitentiary. And as you can see in this Puerto Rico Historic uh, Buildings Drawings Society uh, published photo from Facebook, Oso Blanco uh, was an imposing uh, multi-level concrete structure. It had more than 300 cells when it opened in the 1930s, uh, and surrounding it were about 70 acres of cultivable land. Uh, and indeed, one of the goals or missions of Oso Blanco was to be self-sustaining at the time. So uh, that land was put to use by producing sugar, rice, beans, potatoes, uh, uh, plantains, bananas, among other crops. Uh, it had a Art Deco, Neo Moorish architectural style. Uh, and as uh, the recently convicted would have entered the facility, they would have entered right through the front gate. And this is what they would have seen, this image also from uh, the Puerto Rico Historic uh, Building Drawing Society Facebook page, uh, Concepcion Aranal, the famous uh, 19th century Spanish feminist writer and sociologist slogan, or at least a slogan ascribed to her, Odia el delito y compadece al delincuente, uh, hate the crime and pity the criminal, which in many ways, right, is suggestive of the logic and practice of rehabilitative corrections uh, in mid-20th century Puerto Rico. The assumption that we're dealing with human beings, right, and, and uh, consciousness needs to be raised in them so they don't break uh, social norms and unlearn uh, behaviors that uh, landed them in prison in the first place. And also to the left and right, uh, these sculptured engravings representing uh, justice and law. And going inside, uh, clearly being documented, archived, booked, uh, photographed, uh, redressed, potentially getting their heads shaved, uh, being assigned a cell block, going to the medical annex to uh, have a physical perform, all of that would have been part of the process of intake in a facility like this in the mid 20th century. Now, also Blanco formed part of a broader uh, project, uh, the City Beautiful Movement, uh, based out of Chicago through a firm like Bennett, Parsons, and Frost, uh, which was active in Puerto Rico and other parts of the world during the 1920s, helped spearhead uh, an urban beautification uh, project in Puerto Rico in the 1920s specifically. Uh, the Iowan governor, Forrest Towner, works with this firm to start the project on the capital grounds of Old San Juan, uh, the garden spaces surrounding the capital, the scenic ocean-facing boulevards also in that area, and the project reaches into neighboring communities, including Puerta de Tierra, where the lush uh, park, Luis Munoz Rivera Park, uh, was constructed, and then going into Santulce and beyond, Rio Piedra specifically, uh, the University of Puerto Rico was renovated and expanded as a part of that project. And on the hinterland, on the outskirts of that project, uh, the tri-institutional complex, as I call it, which were uh, three facilities that treated infirm people, uh, a tuberculosis sanitarium for patients suffering for, from tuberculosis, an insane asylum for the mentally infirm, and a penitentiary, the capstone project, the last one to be completed in 1933 which uh, sought to diagnose and treat uh, those who were suffering from uh, criminal uh, issues. And this project uh, is relevant 
for a number of reasons. The first being that it's a sanitary city. It's one that seeks to, to transform and firm individuals into healthy citizens. Uh, this is in the wake of U.S. citizenship in 1917. So again, I stress the point that we aren't dealing with uh, questions about the humanity of these people, but how to make and firm people healthy so uh, their potential right, allows them to participate in civic society. And uh, re living dead, right, th that idea comes uh, to bear in, in, in this sanitary city, at least from my point of view, in that transformation. Uh, to, to raise individuals physically, uh, mentally, socially uh, from their predicaments into a different type of Puerto Rican, uh, a part of the modernization projects uh, of that era. Now, uh, this project in Puerto Rico uh, is not unique. Uh, the emergence of modern penitentiaries start in North America, uh, in the Americas at least, in the 18th century, uh, in Latin America or the Latin part of the Americas in the 19th century. And the project works its way up to Central America and the Caribbean by the early uh, 20th century and into the middle decades of the 20th century. And, and it's a part of US empire building uh, in the Caribbean, specifically, especially the Spanish speaking islands. Uh, the first modern penitentiaries uh, in that part of the Caribbean actually uh, emerge in Hispaniola, uh, the national penitentiary in Haiti and the Negro penitentiary in San Cristobal, Dominican Republic, moving into the 1920s. Uh, that was a part of uh, modernization and centralization projects uh, on that island specifically. Uh, in the case of Cuba, a neo-colonial relationship with the United States uh, helps spearhead the development of the Presidio Modelo, uh, which has more of a panoptic architectural uh, style, as you can see uh, in the images uh, on this slide. It was modeled after the Stateville Correctional Center in Crest Hill, Illinois, and that project happening uh, in the 1920s and moving forward as well. And then Puerto Rico, a construction on the insular penitentiary begins in 1927 and concludes in 1933 when the penitentiary is finally uh, inaugurated. So that Caribbean dimension that I referred to earlier will manifest itself here. There's a shared structure, right, of penitentiaries uh, across the, Sp the, the Spanish speaking uh, and French speaking uh, in the case of, uh, and Creole speaking uh, in the case of Haiti. Uh, and I'm interested in sort of the wider Caribbean as well, what this looks like in different corners of the Caribbean. That's something that remains to be seen right in this research. Uh, another Caribbean facing dimension of what was happening in the Puerto Rican prison system at the time are the actual bodies that flow through it. And this statistical portrait is a snapshot uh, of what that looked like between 1933 and 1947 when Oso Blanco opened and an era of penal reforms in Puerto Rico in the 1940s. In 1947, uh, that was a moment when uh, a Bureau of Prisons and, or, or Corrections was established. Uh, there are, are a few more transitions after that, but the reports of the Attorney General are silent on the quote unquote foreign makeup of the inmate body after 47. But as you can see here, more than 80 individuals with Caribbean roots of some kind end up in the Puerto Rican prison system, particularly from Cuba, the Dominican Republic, and the Virgin Islands, although they also came from Venezuela, uh, Jamaica, St. Kitts, and Haiti. Uh, I also included Englishmen uh, on this statistical portrait, given that right, the British Caribbean is still a thing at the time. Uh, there are also references to uh, South America and the continental United States. And in inmate files, one finds that uh, Colombians and Floridians, for example, also entered and exited Puerto Rico's prison system. So the, these 80 or so, uh, the 80 or so total you see here actually uh, may very well be more than 100 for these 14 or 15 years. It's just one example of what's Caribbean facing uh, about right, my work. Here you get an overview of the book itself, the table of contents. And as you can see, uh, this project uh, is in, in, in shape. At this point, it doesn't mean that it won't have some changes moving forward since it's under review, but I'm pretty comfortable with where it is at this point. Uh, overall, it's a book of seven chapters that spans nearly five decades. As I mentioned earlier, uh, U.S. citizenship 1917 to the mid-1960s, the conclusion of the era of uh, Luis Munoz Marin, Puerto Rico's first democratically elected governor. Uh, so it covers the introduction of U.S. citizenship and the waning years of U.S. colonial rule proper, 
uh, to the emergence of colonial populism uh, and, and the Commonwealth status, right, that was introduced in the early 1950s and slightly beyond. Uh, the chapters themselves showcase the entanglement of physical, mental, social health, and religiousness, spirituality, and other humanistic and communal embodiments and impulses in the history of rehabilitative corrections. Uh, the book demonstrates that medical and social scientists and social workers deployed the tools of science and medicine to raise convicts from bodily, social, and civic death. Meanwhile, convicts, their families, and the, their broader communities often tap into religion, the humanities, and health activism in order to prevent, cope with, or recover, recover from all manner of sickness and infirmity. So in other words, uh, in the introduction, I, I engage relevant literatures. The first chapter and the last chapter, one and seven, are the community-facing chapters. They focus on death and health activism through executive clemency. And the heart, the meat of the book, chapters two to six, are the different facets of holistic health care, from biomedicine and mind science, that is psychology and psychiatry, to social work, uh, religiosity and spirituality, uh, and the uh, humanities, broadly speaking. Uh, at the end, I conclude by discussing uh, the post-65 period uh, through our own times where I briefly reflect on the COVID-19 pandemic and how it helps us revisit holistic prison health care, particularly given uh, the emphasis on convict bodies uh, that has been circulating uh, in mainstream media outlets, for example, uh, since late last year when uh, the vaccines right started uh, to, to, to get distributed. So now we'll move into sort of a, a discussion of the literatures and a chapter by chapter snapshot before I uh, provide some preliminary conclusions. I see myself as engaging three main bodies uh, of literature in this work, crime punishment and the new history of medicine, reform and abolition, and uh, the archive and power. And the first of these you could split into two as well, crime and punishment and the new history of medicine, but I merge them or fuse them because I believe that uh, doing so allows us to enter a different kind of perspective with regard to this sort of history. Uh, crime and punishment here is not just sort of what I referred to earlier, how, you know, the chronology of penitentiaries and how it moved from one corner of the Americas to another, uh, but rather transitions. Transitions from, for example, the colony to the nation uh, in the 19th century Americas in particular, uh, enslavement to the prison, uh, or in the case of Puerto Rico, uh, from uh, being a Spanish colony to a U.S. colony. Uh, and in that context, the history of incarceration of Puerto Rico is relevant. Uh, we have to go back to early, early Spanish colonial urban planning, uh, where in those grids, jails uh, typically inform part of right, these, uh, these uh, initial attempts to create an urban sprawling zone or, or an urban area. Uh, and, and in the aftermath of that, the emergence of a network of military fortifications around those urban areas, which had regional connections across the Caribbean and even across the Atlantic world, uh, and the ways in which convict bodies provide labor power uh, in those venues. Uh, Jose Lee Borges's work on, uh, on Puerto Rico uh, about the Chinese and how they were used, for example, to uh, develop inward-looking infrastructure like Arretera Central, the Central Road, uh, in the 19th century. Uh, and the emergence of penitentiaries uh, in their first variant in Puerto Rico, one like La Princesa in Old San Juan, which didn't live up to the reform hype of the era. Uh, so what's that question, what's at stake, is how do you incorporate marginalized or excluded others into reformed colonial bodies or new national bodies? Uh, and that's sort of what's touched on, at least one of the things that's touched on in that literature. I'm beginning my conversation or my contribution after that happens, uh, 1917, when it's not a question of whether somebody's human or not, uh, but rather whether they have the civic capacity uh, to uh, reintegrate successfully into society. Uh, so there, there's an important contribution in that sense, one that sort of transcends typical ways of telling the, the history of crime and punishment. As for the new history of medicine, the new history of medicine typically has been written in a narrow way. Uh, histories of disease, the body, uh, research institutions and initiatives, major personalities, and so on. So what I'm trying to do is stretch that into medical humanistic terrain. And a, a medical humanities perspective allows us to 
uh, get interior views of the world of medicine, uh, the reflexive and reflective thinking of health professionals and incarcerated people, uh, how incarcerated people negotiate the relationship between medicine and belief, uh, medical technology, health policy, how they experience suffering, uh, how they define uh, death and dying, care, well-being. So a medical humanities perspective allows us to open up the history of medicine in ways that transcend narratives that would have us ultimately circle back to discussions of the racialization of medicine, for example, uh, as well as the racialization of medicine, for example, as well as eugenic science and structural violence. Uh, the second body of literature, reform and abolition, uh, their rehabilitative corrections is clearly about reform. There are important penal reforms that happened in Puerto Rico in the 1940s in particular. However, we don't really understand this period in the broader scholarly literature. Uh, we understand abolitionism in its 19th century variant, right? The abolition of racial slavery. And part of those conversations uh, pertain to the abolition of prisons. However, with early penal reforms thereafter, with the humanization of punishment or the so-called humanization of punishment, we enter a rehabilitative era. What we know about it is that it failed. And uh, many scholars are quick to caricature or trivialize that era uh, precisely because it failed, move into mass incarceration and our own times where, of course, as we all know, uh, there are debates about uh, the utility of reforms and whether policing and prisons themselves are obsolete institutions and need to be abolished. So what I'm trying to do here is uh, have us account for that gulf in our understanding. Uh, I don't believe at least that we can productively imagine a new future without a complete understanding of the era immediately preceding the one that many of us are so dissatisfied with, which is the current one that we live in. And finally, the archive and power uh, here uh, I'm looking at the archive for what it can literally tell us while critically engaging it. Uh, I'm not trying to perform semantic gymnastics uh, around the archival record. I'm not trying to just say there are silences or creative ways of reading against the archival brain or that there are biases buried in the archive. I'm not even trying to say that you know, how I control sources is what matters the most. In fact, I don't see myself as more moral or more honest uh, in terms of the interpretation of this history as what preceded uh, my work on this topic. I, I simply want us to account for that era and that requires us to dig into the documentary record, do the work and draw uh, the conclusions that the sources dictate. Uh, yes, of course, that requires critical uh, questioning and examination, uh, but I'm not really interested in sort of making a theoretical contribution to the subfield of archival studies, uh, which sort of uh, discards, right, the significance of the archive in many ways uh, and simply views it as a racialized site of knowledge production. While all of that is true, I think that there's still important questions about what we literally know about this period that need to be answered. And Claire Eddington in her wonderful book, Beyond the Asylum, does precisely this. She defines it as a counterintuitive approach to the study of colonial asylum archives, specifically uh, mental uh, asylums in French colonial Vietnam. And she says that she reads such records for what they can tell us about life outside these sorts of facilities as much as life inside these facilities. And what that does is that it reveals emotional ties and everyday pressures that resulted in new strategies and forms of accommodation within and between families, communities, and the broader colonial state in the early 20th century. So in my examination of uh, inmate records, parole records, uh, clemency petitions, and, and the private letters of prisoners, uh, their kin, their family members, uh, their wider uh, social networks and communities, uh, historical periodicals and, and newspapers, uh, photography and, image, and, and other kinds of images, all the sources uh, that I use to tell the story I propose, I use this kind of uh, counterintuitive logic, right, so that the archive is respected while it's critically engaged. So now we'll move into a, a brief overview or snapshots of these different chapters. Uh, I'll pose a few conclusions or at least what I think are conclusions at this point, uh, and then Emilio will uh, provide his commentary and hopefully we can move into discussion thereafter. 
Uh, so chapter one establishes the multiple meanings of death in Caribbean prisons and the many ways in which prisoners died in order to introduce a new epistemology for understanding incarcerated people and their wider communities, the living dead. The chapter considers the politics of death in Oso Blanco, Nigua, and other Caribbean prisons between the 1920s and mid-century. This chapter traces what corporeal and symbolic death entailed. Convicts succumbed to all manner of disease while incarcerated, they were the victims of interpersonal self-inflicted and political violence. Many prisoners endured weeks and months in solitary confine confinement, which is a, a, an example of, of you know, the tombs of the living, living death personified. Deaf experiences in, in Oso Blanco especially resonated with communities beyond prison walls. Authorities attempted to contact the loved ones of deceased inmates no matter where they were located to notify them of their loss in funerary arrangements. The poverty and geographic inaccessibility of many families made it difficult for them to receive news and recover the bodies of their dead kin. While some families traveled to Oso Blanco to attend funerals, most convicts were buried by prison employees or other inmates in nearby cemeteries. Uh, in this Google map, image that I'm sharing on this slide, the bottom left area is where the are the former grounds of Oso Blanco, and the red pin area on the top right uh, is Cementerio Villa Nevares, where many uh, incarcerated people were buried during the years in question. So you can see how much distance was traversed. There are also references to a cemetery about 10 or 11 kilometers north of here, Villa Palmeras and Santurce, where uh, the bodies of incarcerated people uh, were also deposited after they passed away. Family members and units mobilized to claim the material resources left behind by expired prisoners, uh, showcasing how the dead were central to the world of the living and the need to do this, illustrating that the families and kin of prisoners uh, led bare existences, led bare lives, which was uh, another manifestation, right, of living death, not necessarily of the prisoners, uh, but of their extended communities. Uh, their public journalists and writers traveled to prisons and bore witness to the ambiance of living death. Their published accounts helped shape broader perceptions of incarceration and even the consciousness of incarcerated people themselves. And the two works on the left uh, of the slide, uh, Cuban Spaniard Eduardo Samacoises, Los Vivos Muertos, a novel uh, about the living dead in Primo de Rivera, Spain, during this period, uh, which talks about how uh, the prison uh, destroys kin uh, relationships uh, and, and essentially has a cannibalistic effect on the incarcerated. Uh, and Dry Guillotine, uh, the uh, Frenchman Rene Belbonois uh, memoir about escaping French Guiana, uh, and it becomes a very popular memoir, in fact. Uh, in, in the 1930s into the 1940s and helped circulate the idea of living death to uh, North American audiences, uh, for example, as well as uh, sort of reflections on French Guiana specifically in uh, mainstream periodicals such as Puerto Rico Ilustrado, uh, I've come across frequent references to the living dead there as well. So this is an idea that's circulating in Puerto Rico at large and also in different corners of the Caribbean uh, in the middle decades of the 20th century. Chapter two examines Puerto Ricans' initial turn toward rehabilitative corrections after receiving U.S. citizenship in 1917. Between the 1920s and early 1940s, prison health care in the archipelago slowly melted criminal anthropology into everyday practice, including the infamous mugshot, right, which we see in the El Mundo image uh, to the left uh, of this slide. However, uh, the penitentiary mission primarily orbited a biomedical emphasis during this period. Uh, between, before and after 1933, when Oso Blanco finally opened, physicians in the wider Puerto Rican medical community viewed prisons as laboratorial spaces and their inhabitants as specimens that could advance scientific knowledge about disease and tropical medicine. Biomedical experts like Cuban physician Seferino Mendez Polo, who we see in the bottom right, uh, uh, incarcerated person's drawing or sketch uh, studied convicts' bodies in the penitentiary hospital hospital annex, which is in right uh, the rear of uh, Oso Blanco during these years, which we see on the top right uh, side of the current slide. 
uh, where they uh, ex examine convict bodies to better grasp hookworm, syphilis, and tuberculosis, among other debilitating and life-threatening conditions, and to experiment with and standardize diagnosis and treatment models. Tests to gauge infectious disease, the use of toxic substances to treat disease, and surgeries that cheated biological death were commonplace at the time. The chapter traces the biomedical knowledge, technologies, and material practices that shape Puerto Rican penitentiary science and the physical health experiences of the incarcerated. Chapter three focuses on the late 1930s through the early 1950s, when Oso Blanco morphed into more of a social health institution. This second layer of the penitentiary mission coincided with the birth of Oso Blanco's classification and treatment board, an interdisciplinary entity that studied convicts and imagined rehabilitative programs for them. The fields of psychology and psychiatry powerfully contributed to these efforts. The diagnostic tools and interpretations of mental health experts, such as the psychological and psychiatric evaluations on this slide, in the middle of the slide, a psychiatric evaluation pertaining to the Spanish psychiatrist Rafael Troyano de los Rios, and on the right, uh, of the slide, uh, Wechsler Bellevue uh, exam results uh, uh, provided by the psychologist Juan B. Picard. Uh, these sorts of evaluations contextualize crime uh, in prison life in ways that biomedicine could not. Psychologists utilize Western psychometrics to measure the intelligence, manual skills, and personalities of convicts. Psychiatrists drew from Iberian and U.S. psychiatric traditions to explain mental infirmities and to recommend treatment routes. The latter often meant agricultural labor therapy given the rural or kibaro, rural peasant roots of more than half the penitentiary population during the period in question. Uh, and Rafael Troyano de los Rios, uh, this Spanish psychiatrist who departs uh, from his homeland in the wake of the Spanish Civil War, he ends up in the Dominican Republic where he helps advance labor theory in the Nigua Mental Asylum. Nigua closed as a penitentiary in 1938. It reopens in the 40s as a, a mental asylum, and there Troyano de los Rios helps advance that kind of psychiatric knowledge production before he moves on to Puerto Rico in the mid-40s, where he directs the insular insane asylum of the tri-institutional complex, and subsequently in the early 50s, he's the medical director at Oso Blanco. Uh, Again, right, these Atlantic, in this case, and Caribbean dimensions to uh, what a history of the medical humanities looks like from the vantage point of a carceral facility. Uh, this chapter demonstrates how mental health professionals and pathologized prisoners while insisting that they were mentally salvageable and civically capable. After restoring the physical body, reanimating the living dead meant sparking them intellectually and vocationally. Chapter four examines the efforts of social workers and parole officers in Oso Blanco and other prisons in the 1940s and 50s. These professionals, uh, such as Gloria Umpierre, uh, who's on the left side of this slide in, in an El Mundo image, uh, served as foot soldiers for the classification and treatment and parole boards. They assembled socioeconomic histories, uh, a portion of which we see on the right side of the slide, uh, and investigative reports to determine the social health of convicts and their prospects for societal reincorporation, and also sought to problem solve the failures of rehabilitation. Social workers and parole officers visited the communities of origin of incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people, where they spoke with family members, neighbors, and peers, and probed ex-prisoners and prisoners' extended networks, whether these were educational, uh, labor, religious, and so on. The resulting paper trail produced psychosocial portraits of ex-inmates and inmates. Social health professionals infused these profiles with their own observations of prisoner and parolee behaviors, body language and rationales, which they distinguished during comprehensive interviews. This chapter explores the ethics and contributions of social health professionals and the regional reach of Caribbean social work to illustrate the centrality of social work to the project of raising the living dead. Uh, when I say Caribbean reach, there uh, I'm referring to the movement within the Caribbean uh, to address uh, professional questions. For example, Dominican social workers would visit uh, 
Puerto Rico to uh, attend seminars on uh, social work logics and practices and then return uh, to the Dominican Republic to try to implement those ideas in the development of the profession there. Uh, Cubans visited Puerto Rico for a crime and punishment conference uh, during this era of rehabilitative corrections. So there are these integrated Caribbean dimensions that help us understand uh, this story of uh, rehabilitative corrections, right, in Puerto Rico specifically. Uh, whereas physical death was difficult to overcome, and mental and social death were frustrating to resolve, spiritual death could be resolved somewhat more fruitfully. Chapter 5 spotlights the varied systems of religious and spiritual thought and ritual that were integral to institutional rehabilitative programming in the 1940s and 50s. While inmates embraced health and social science and also Blanco, they also looked elsewhere to get by and better. Their pursuit of well-being obligated them to consider the non-corporeal aspects of their health. Rigid and vernacular forms of Catholicism and denominational Christianity flourished in Oso Blanco, Nigua, and the Presidio Morelo. Spiritism, theosophy, and Islam circulated to varying degrees, as did Hindu philosophy and secular ideologies like nationalism. Inmates reflected on the meanings, contradictions, and liberating effects of belief individually through testimony, in groups through congregational spaces, uh, like the chapel from the uh, women's industrial prison in Vega Alta, which you see in the El Mundo image to the left, uh, and in dialogue with community partners. Uh, the testimony, for example, on the right-hand side of the screen uh, is reproduced by a transnational mystery uh, missionary who in turn received uh, information about uh, a letter that a local Puerto Rican missionary uh, had obtained from a prisoner. Uh, in Oso Blanco, and that prisoner talks about the, the social illness uh, of sin, how uh, his encounter with Jesus Christ helped him transform his life, how it helped him understand that he had uh, battles that were going on around him that weren't because of the flesh and blood relations with others, but with uh, spiritual high powers and principalities. There's another epistemology and ontology to account for when we view these experiences through the prism uh, of religiosity and spirituality. Uh, so uh, what this chapter is trying to do is it's trying to reveal the dynamism of belief, its implications for well-being and how convicts interacted with the sacred to achieve self-improvement, healing, and degrees of freedom. And for us to take seriously what prisoners say help them uh, in their carceral experiences. And that's the headline in the middle of the image here, right? An ex-prisoner who participated in the uh, mass escape of 1950, which coincided with an insurrection in Oso Blanco and wider Puerto Rico, led by radical nationalists and other dissidents. He credits religion uh, with a return to a normal life uh, as a citizen. Uh, so really taking seriously what individuals say about their own stories and lives uh, is very important to this chapter and other parts of this book in progress. In addition to belief, the humanities also afforded convicts with opportunities for life after social and civic death. Chapter six explores humanistic logics and practices during the high point of rehabilitative corrections in Puerto Rico in the late 1940s and 1950s. The therapeutic humanities, including literature and the fine and performing arts, thrived in Oso Blanco and complemented the efforts of classification and treatment efforts, experts. They were not simply imposed from the top down, however. Prisoners often took the initiative by expressing their need for opportunities beyond those they could already access, such as primary education, vocational training, and agriculture. Convicts who pursued humanistic awakening demonstrated a sensibility for higher education that they cultivated everywhere from the penitentiary's library to its patio. Again, another way of raising a different kind of consciousness in incarcerated people. And in this particular uh, slide, uh, there's a prisoner uh, named Rufino uh, Ingles Caraballo who was serving time for violent extortion in the mid 20th century. And he read about a book a week. And he, what you see here uh, are the books that he read. And the, these books cover uh, Caribbean, uh, um, US American, European, Atlantic, and broader global uh, literature during the years in question, including the work of Mario Puccini, uh, from Italy, Enrique Anorim from Uruguay, Ramon Valle Inclán from Spain, 
Santos Chocano from Peru, Leopoldo Alas from Spain, Ivan Turgenev from Russia, Hugo Was from Argentina, the Quintero brothers of Spain, Ruben Darío from Nicaragua, Rachel Field in the United States, William Shakespeare in England, and so on. Uh, what this chapter ultimately tries to do is exhibit the civic orientation, reach, and transformative power of the therapeutic humanities in Oso Blanco. The final chapter of the book assesses executive clemency from the 1930s through mid-century to illustrate that health relationships and movements were as important to prisoners as the scientific and humanistic knowledge and practices circulating inside prisons. This is the book's sole comparative chapter. It focuses on Puerto Rico, but also surveys the Dominican Republic, where a similar system results and indeed a shared structure prevailed despite the different political order that existed across the Mona Passage. The chapter highlights the analytical promise of considering Puerto Rico in Caribbean context first, rather than as an afterthought. A culture of health activism spearheaded and enacted by incarcerated people and the medical allies with whom they forge relationships in and around Oso Blanco often characterized the Puerto Rican case, uh, as you can see from the, the, the clemency, clemency letter on the right-hand side of the screen, which is signed by health professionals uh, who knew uh, a prisoner named Graciano Arroyo Rivera and worked intimately with him. While regional variability and more holistic and interpersonal health networks stand out in the Dominican case, uh, a, a, an example of a letter on the left-hand side of, of, of this slide which is written by uh, the mother, uh, wife, and brothers of an individual who was incarcerated uh, in, a, in a public jail in the Dominican Republic. And there, right, the logic and practice behind asking for his uh, uh, clemency for him revolved around uh, really the minute details of his life uh, and their lives, as opposed to how the health professionals in the Puerto Rican case cast their letter where they talked about rehabilitating uh, the civic rights and political privileges uh, of Arroyo Rivera. So uh, we're about 39 minutes in. I'll take a few minutes here to talk about some preliminary conclusions and then I'll turn it over to Emilio uh, for his comments. Uh, I think this study is important for a number of reasons, uh, several of which I started this talk with and they're worth reiterating at this point. This kind of study and trying to make it Caribbean facing acknowledges that the United States is relevant to the history of Puerto Rican rehabilitative corrections, but also seeks to transcend the US centric key. Transcending the US centric key, uh, as I develop in the latter parts of this text uh, in light of new sources, uh, is, is, is necessary. Puerto Rico was looking inward and across the Caribbean more so than just implementing models and blueprints from the US mainland that happened, but also federal studies carried out in the 1940s and 50s reveal uh, that Puerto Rico was trying to do its own thing with rehabilitative corrections, uh, which invites us to also understand this history beyond the diasporic prism, beyond uh, migration, and beyond US empire base in Washington, DC. It also uh, allows us to see that biomedicine and mind science are but two windows of starting points to tell a history of medicine and by extension, medical humanities. Uh, a medical humanities perspective uh, enriches the histories of medicine that we tell and adds complexity to them beyond the narrow prescriptions uh, and analyses that I referred to earlier. Indeed, if I just looked at crime, punishment, and medicine, again, it's worth reiterating, many of the conclusions would be, this was racialized medicine, look at eugenic science in action, and oh my, there's a lot of structural violence. And I think there's more to this story than, than those three types of uh, reductive conclusions. Uh, so this, this type of work also allows us to fill the gap between racial slavery and the contemporary moment, not caricaturing or trivializing the era of rehabilitative corrections uh, in favor of discussions of mass incarceration and contemporary abolitionism, but rather actually understanding this period. Uh, if we have an incomplete an incomplete, excuse me, under, understanding of rehabilitative corrections or the history of incarceration, then we can't really feign to say that we're going to imagine a better world moving forward. We have to have hard discussions uh, and account for critical micro-level pers perspectives that intersect with structures, 
And I think that is sort of a way that uh, will allow us to problem solve carceral issues in the present rather than just merely sort of uh, discard the, the history of this era uh, as insignificant or as just marked by failures. An additional point here is that uh, abolitionism today uh, and its emphasis on uh, identifying the causes of crime or how to best invest in reincorporating people successfully into society after they exit prisons, uh, there, that actually, as, we, as I've suggested, uh, uh, early versions of that happened during the era of rehabilitative corrections uh, through social work, for example, and the creation of probation and parole infrastructure. So revisiting, right, what went wrong after the introduction of those types of approaches suits us better than just saying that there's nothing at all uh, that we can salvage from this period to help us understand the present and the future. Uh, and last but not least, critically engaging or respecting the archive. Uh, the sources that I use to tell this story, again, help us see points of view that we otherwise wouldn't if we merely emphasize uh, structures. Emphasizing agencies is necessary. Uh, the intersection between the two is necessary for a complete and nuanced history of something as polemical uh, as rehabilitative corrections or incarceration in general. Uh, thank you so much for, for listening, uh, and I turn it over to Emilio, uh, who will continue. Let me thank you. Very, there thank you very much, Alberto. Uh, it was a very interesting talk, and, uh, and uh, I think it's a very interesting story, very incisive. And it's a, a piece of uh, classical scholarship in the sense that you go to the sources and you, and you really uh, dig up the data. Uh, what, what it's interesting to me is that uh, the, the whole, there is a whole progressive notion uh, in, and a view, uh, but this is not a Puerto Rican view. This is a, this is a view of uh, uh, American progressives and I was just checking uh, uh, on, on the notes, and uh, there, these were the, the, the construction of Oso Blanco and the development of this whole complex was under the tutelage of Theodore Roosevelt Jr. and James Beverly. Uh, these were kind of progressive governors who, I would say, took pity on Puerto Rico because Puerto Rico was the poor house of the Caribbean, as later. Uh, Governor Tugwell would uh, dub it, uh, and this the, uh, and, and Beverly was the only American governor to speak Spanish before he was appointed. So he had an, a certain understanding and, and, and somewhat of an empathy, same as uh, Theodore Roosevelt Jr., who was sort of a, a sort of a humane person, uh, an empathetic governor, and so this is a project. Uh, which is rather progressive for the time, it's sort of a rehabilitated emphasis, not only on uh, the living dead, not only on people incarcerated, but also in terms of looking at uh, psychiatric problems as diseases, rather than the, you know the demons or or some other form of uh, of a handicap. So in that sense, uh, uh, you you are opening the door to. What I would consider, because I don't know that there are that many stories on Puerto Rico in terms of, of, of that. Uh, the other point that, that comes to my mind was the role of, of uh, social workers. Uh, the fact of the matter is that there is an old tradition of social work in Puerto Rico. The Beatriz La Salle School of Social Work has been there for decades. I don't remember the exact uh, year in which it was but it was one of the first professional schools at the university. And in fact, I remember the old building at the, of the Beatriz La Salle School. I was still standing where there is the area today of uh, Plaza Universitaria. Uh, and so there is a long tradition uh, of, uh, of social workers, and, which is part of a progressive view of the social mission of government and the intervention of government. And remember, this is before the New Deal. Uh, so this is kind of uh, uh, ahead of, it, of its times, I would suggest. You are the historian, you have to tell me whether it was ahead of its times or just right on time. 
or it was part of the, what they call the zeitgeist, the, the, the spirit of the times, no? uh, this progressive view. But the fact of the matter is that it is fascinating uh, uh, and it contrasts with today where we, where we know so much in terms of Puerto Rico. And uh, for example, psychiatric services, public psychiatric services in Puerto Rico are dismal. Uh, and, uh, and incarceration services as well are uh, dismal in Puerto Rico. Uh, so it, 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 it's a very interesting point. And in fact, I was reminded uh, when I was a boy, my, 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 my aunt on my mother's side, my oldest aunt, bought a house near El Manicomio. And in fact, her house from El Reparto Metropolitano, the new young, the, the new, the emerging suburban areas, uh, had, uh, you could see the manicomio uh, directly from her house. Uh, and, 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 and you could see the whole complex, which is now, it doesn't, uh, and, and, and when we passed there, uh, I could see the platanos. There was a, a great planting, <laughs> plantation from, uh, and when I asked my mother, you just reminded me when I asked my mother, these are the prisoners, the cultivan, no, these are the prisoners, and, and, and it was a large estate. Uh, and, and so that, that stuck in my mind uh, as, 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 a, as a rather important memory of my childhood, no? going by the Presidio, by El Oso Blanco, and seeing all those platanos down there. I always thought that it would be easy for, for prisoners to escape and, and simply hide behind, uh, underneath the platanos while they uh, eluded, but that never did happen. Uh, the other thing is that if you look at the complex, there are certain things and once you develop them, persist. Uh, although they destroyed the Oso Blanco, uh, El Sanatorio is now what is Centro Medico, the medical center. Uh, and, and the medical center has a number of components, uh, one of which is the School of Health of the University of Puerto Rico. And of course, the most important medical facilities in the complex. So it is, it is a rather, it was a rather progressive uh, view of the world, but it was not uh, a Puerto Rican project. It was an American project. And when, when you contrast uh, Puerto Rico with the other, the other two uh, countries of the Caribbean that you're looking at, Cuba and, and the Dominican Republic, uh, it, it'll, it'll, it'll be interesting to see that, that counterpoint no? of how were the progressive uh, elements in the Dominican Republic and Cuba thinking vis-a-vis this American project. And it's interesting that you mentioned a doctor uh, that was uh, the head of uh, medical facilities uh, in, in El Oso Blanco, but before that was in the manicomio. And he went to the Dominican Republic to help, help develop. And he's a Puerto Rican. So it will be rather interesting to follow that figure and see what is the influence, whether as, as it has happened throughout history in Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico uh, being a colony of the United States, uh, but being a Spanish speaking colony rather than an English speaking colony. And we being Latin American and, 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 and looking more like, uh, like the Dominican, uh, by the Dominicans and Cubans than we look like Floridians <laughs> or like, or uh, Iowans or Illinoisans. Uh, being, being Latin America, it, is, it has always been sort of a, a, a trade of, of, of the sort of most advanced and most educated cadres in Puerto Rico to go and, uh, and help. Uh, it's sort of a, a before, a, before the inter-American initiatives, no? Puerto Ricans were always being sent uh, to Latin America because we had a, a certain advanced knowledge of what was happening in the United States. Just, just thoughts that, that I throw there for you to, 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 to look at when you, when, you, when, you, when you deal with this. As we have only eight, uh, five people in, in, in our webinar audience, there, there are more people that in, uh, in, uh, in uh, watching this through uh, YouTube, but they cannot talk. Uh, I would like to open the floor if, if uh, any of the participants has a question, I would like to ask uh, Juan, my, our assistant, to open the, 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 the mics so that these people can talk. If, if any of you want to talk, please raise your hand or send a note. Uh, 
and tell us, tell us, uh, uh, give us your questions, share your thoughts. The floor is open. There are no takers, <laughs> Alberto. Any thoughts, that you want, any reaction that you want to have uh, of, of my comments? Your reactions to my comments, uh, Alberto. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Emilio, for those comments. And uh, you cover quite a bit of ground in them. Uh, I think the main thing about the progressive view that you bring up is that it's useful to frame the kind of book I'm trying to write. I'm going to stop for a moment because someone's microphone is on. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, the progressive view that you bring up, uh, well, it's useful to frame what's going on in Puerto Rico because at this point, Puerto Rico is 40, 50 years into United States rule. Uh, it's an unincorporated territory. They're US citizens, right? To a degree, we can't separate the two from one another. Uh, so I'm not suggesting we do that. And I can see where I can pepper in uh, your suggestions about uh, this progressive view, uh, particularly during the era of the New Deal. Uh, you brought up social work and indeed, social work begins to make important strides in the 1920s right on the eve of the New Deal uh, uh, and its application in Puerto Rico, right, through something like the, the PRRA, the Puerto Rico Reconstruct Reconstruction Administration, uh, amongst other entities. And the school of social work emerges uh, definitively by the early 1940s. Uh, so, right, there, there are important uh, currents that have to be accounted for. And in the context of social work, there's a, a, a very important connection to Columbia University, uh, and Columbia University involved also in introducing anthropology as we know it to Puerto Rico, the School of Tropical Medicine right near the old Capitol grounds in San Juan during this period, particularly right in the 1920s. Uh, so there is something to be said there. However, what I think I'm doing is showing how even though the U.S. It introduces, if not imposes, uh, this vision is how it turns into something that's specific to Puerto Rico or specific to another one of uh, the neighboring islands and societies, how it is, for lack of a better phrase, creolized, right? How it's nationalized in an era in which uh, there's a competition over what nationalism means in Puerto Rico, whether it'll continue to have a colonial populist connotation, which we know wins out in the end, or whether right a, a different type of perspective beyond cultural nationalism uh, might make some waves. So I can see sort of where to fit it in, uh, and, uh, in particular chapters perhaps more so than others, right? Uh, and definitely uh, as a, a complementary uh, a complement to some of the things I say in the introduction about uh, these other penitentiaries in different corners of the Caribbean. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to refer to is the historical memory of Oso Blanco. Uh, I, I recall vividly conducting dissertation research, uh, I think 2013, 2014, when there were debates about demolishing uh, Oso Blanco and, and architects uh, mobilizing, for example, to preserve it, and the uh, Fideicomiso de Ciencia uh, y Tecnología uh, advancing the project of ultimately demolishing it and how that played out in the press. And I remember the governor uh, at the time during that era in his state, uh, his address, the state, the equivalent of the State of the Union, right, in Puerto Rico, Alejandro Garcia Padilla, if I'm not mistaken, talked about Oso Blanco as simply an artifact of, you know, in terms of violence. And he talked about uh, the disheartening memory associated with it, uh, a memory that really, right, is linked to the 70s and beyond, that post-rehabilitative moment, uh, the rise of the Nietas, uh, right, the prisoner pro-rights organization in Oso Blanco, a deterioration of health and living conditions, the Carlos Feliciano case of 1979, right, which opens the door in the 1980s to the establishment of a centralized office of correctional health care, even though <laughs> that doesn't really bear fruit thereafter. But how Oso Blanco was cast as stuck in that kind of moment in memory, and I kept thinking to myself, you know, they're, they're casting a new city of science, 
right? They want to remake that area uh, as a knowledge corridor. This is the way they were talking about it. Uh, and we actually have right a manifestation of that uh, ge generations before, decades before, uh, yet our selective amnesia doesn't allow us to reconcile that past uh, with the recent, uh, the deep past with the recent past. Um, the Fideicomiso, the Ciencia y Tecnología, now is working on, right, uh, as far as I know, and according to their website, uh, a museum exhibit uh, with regard to Oso Blanco. Uh, and there, who knows what that's going to look like in the end, but my hunch is that it will try to have a comprehensive uh, way of understanding Oso Blanco, uh, which could be useful, right, for uh, understanding uh, the facility's place uh, in the history of Puerto Rico beyond sort of the tropes uh, associated uh, with it primarily, including, right, uh, the history of violence specifically. The other thing you bring up about escapees, uh, I'm actually working on something on the side, hopefully for Caribbean studies, uh, on that. Uh, and they, that does happen, right, through all these decades that, that I cover and even into the recent past. In the dozens, some infamous escapes as recently as the 1990s involving helicopters, uh, uh, but also, right, in the past, people who would go out on work assignment uh, in the areas you were describing from your childhood memories, the, the plantain fields, the nearby cemetery, the nearby communities. You know, there was great fluidity uh, between the three institutions in terms of labor assignments. Uh, prisoners often uh, went to clean the insane asylum or the tuberculosis sanitarium to burn sputum to help produce the food supplies, to serve as orderlies. Uh, there were many opportunities, right, uh, to escape uh, and also, right, to sort of get a sense of life beyond the wall while, while incarcerated, which, you know, is also another way that this study ruptures our understandings of incarceration as enclosed experiences, right? Uh, these people were very much interacting uh, with the world beyond the wall, at times even family members, uh, in, in beautiful ways and also in, in, in interpersonally tense ways. Uh, which comes up in the archival record uh, quite a bit. Uh, the, the last thing I want to bring up uh, with regard to your comments is about Rafael Troyano, the Spaniard who ends up uh, in Puerto Rico. He leaves Spain during the Spanish Civil War or shortly around its end, ends up in the Dominican Republic where he serves as a, a superintendent or co-director of the Nigua Mental Hospital, uh, which had just opened earlier in the 40s uh, it was a penitentiary through 1938. Nigua had more of an agricultural rehabilitative paradigm in the 1920s. Uh, incarcerated people there would get assigned a plot of land, for example, where it, uh, they would mimic what they did on their conucos, right? Uh, they would try to develop that plot of land, uh, and whatever surplus of root crop they developed, they would sell or market, and that profit uh, they would use, right, for uh, whatever they needed in the facility, or uh, they would deliver it to their loved ones or communities beyond uh, the reach of Nigua. That, that agricultural paradigm uh, shifts into an industrial paradigm to a degree in a prison like Fort Osama, right, in the heart of Santo Domingo, through industrial workshops after Nigua closes or roughly around the same time. I'm looking into that, right, uh, as we speak. Uh, but the closure of Nigua in 1938 has more to do with political violence in that institution than with, than with right, uh, uh, the rehabilitative paradigm. Uh, and then a new penitentiary with a quote unquote rehabilitative emphasis isn't open in the Dominican Republic until 1952, northeast of Santo Domingo, right, the La Victoria Penitentiary. So there's a gap from 1938 to 1952 in the Dominican Republic where rehabilitation is in limbo, you might say, to a degree. However, the Trujillo regime is uh, erecting a carceral infrastructure, a very regionalized one, and introduces women's prisons, uh, youth asylums, regional jails, and uh, that project continues in those types of places. Uh, however, right, a centralized institution uh, during the same years that I'm referring to uh, right, is, is missing. And I think that's part of the reason why we see clemency play out in a, a variable way, for example, uh, in, in, in the clemency petitions and letters that I've examined uh, by the dozens and hundreds, in fact. It's a major pattern that you see in that source base. So, you know, those are the, 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 my four major responses um, to what you're saying. Um, so, you know, I guess I, I'll stop here for a moment and let others
uh, pose questions or, or, or comments at this point. Are there any questions from the from the public? Actually, I have a Q and A Q and A comment. Let me see. Isabel Cordova. Uh, gracias. I very much look forward to reading your Polish uh, version using in, uh, using it in the classroom. I find plenty of parallels between your proposal to look beyond Puerto Rico projects as being solely informed by U.S. models, or even collaborating with mimicking U.S. Uh, with the history of social work, medical institutions, which are clearly driven by, by the US, but also ended up looking quite different and patterning with experts in the Caribbean, Europe and Latin America. Uh, uh, I, 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 you're, you're connected, uh, Ms. Cordova. Uh, would you like to make a comment? Juan, can you let uh, Ms. Cordova, Isabel Cordova in? Can you open her mic? Ms. Cordova. Hello. Okay, you, your floor, the floor is yours. Yes, hello. I don't know if I can activate my camera. Can you hear me? Yeah, as long as we can hear you. Yeah, <laughs> no, I was just commenting, I think, very often, especially um, by historians, as a historian myself. Um, I think we do overlook and we don't pay attention to places in the archive where um, a lot of institutions in Puerto Rico and experts in Puerto Rico were collaborating with folks from Europe and Latin America and the Caribbean, because we tend to always pay attention to the collaborations with the United States. And I think in, in places like, for example, the history of social work and medicine, and I, I work on history of birthing, um, we end up actually not mimicking the U.S. and, and, and looking quite quite different and so I found I found it very interesting um, uh, that the proposal to, to pay attention to other kinds of connections Sorry. yeah that's what I was commenting thank on. You very, thank you thank you very much very very important comment uh, I, the, the other thing that I, I just want to just interject the comment is the importance of these social work uh, schools no I have worked in two universities where social work is very prominent. One was the University of Illinois, the Jane, Jane Adams School of uh, Social Work, and UPR, the, the, the Beatriz LaSalle. No? And, and those are very interesting sort of progressive views of uh, the duty of, uh, of, of cities and governments and people. But go ahead, Alberto. No, uh, thank you very much, Isabel, for your comment. And I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, and I am familiar with Isabel's uh, work, right? Uh, pushing in silence. So Isabel, if you're interested in continuing these conversations, you know, I'm more than uh, open to doing so. Um, yes, you know, that's why emphasizing figures like Seferino Mendes Polo, right? The Cuban I referred to, uh, who uh, ended up in Puerto Rico as a, as a young adolescent uh, and traveling back and forth to Cuba uh, while, right, he's becoming a medical professional uh, and how he ends up being an important force in Oso Blanco Penitentiary in particular. I mentioned uh, Rafael Troyano de los Rio earlier. He's a Spaniard, but he's Caribbeanized, right, in his experience in the Dominican Republic, which in many ways mimics why he left uh, Spain in the first place. He has some encounter, disagreeable encounters with the Trujillo's uh, regime's authoritarianism, which helps, right, uh, facilitate his movement to Puerto Rico. So there we have an Atlantic Caribbean sort of movement, but nonetheless still uh, in the same register as what Isabel is mentioning in her comments, among many others, right? And I think that's one of the goals of the book, too, to bring to the surface uh, these transnational or uh, 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 health professionals and their sub-regional experiences within the Caribbean, uh, depending on how they move around uh, the Caribbean and for what purposes. Excellent. Uh, Ms. Cordova, uh, Professor Cordova just said that she would love to stay in touch. So if you, uh, Alberto, if you can type your, your email on the Q&A, uh, that's one way of doing it. If not, we can dig out the emails of both of you and, and give it to each other. But, <laughs> are they? Uh, oh, okay. That, there is, uh, uh, Ms. Cordova, Professor Cordova just, just uh, type hers. Please copy it. It's in the Q&A. <laughs> so that otherwise we... We, we may lose the, the momentum, no? I just don't, wanna, don't want the, the, the comment to, to be there in the air because I know how important these exchanges are. 
And uh, so, are there any other comments? I have. We have other people, uh, and, uh, and and of course, uh, you may continue, Professor Cordova, to 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 to, to discuss. I mean, we have uh, we have time. Uh, we have uh, ten more minutes at least. Uh, so we're we're well within time. Well, if there are no more comments, uh, uh, now you, you can follow exchanges uh, through email and, uh, and, and we're very happy and we thank you very much, Alberto, for a magnificent talk and uh, a very scholarly one. I mean, I, I always say that scholars are a thing of the past. Uh, and uh, <laughs> with Google, we're, we're, we're not necessary anymore. And I always enjoy good scholarly discussions like this of subjects that are rather unusual uh, and, and, and specialized uh, and with people like you and Professor Cordova obviously who know quite a bit and who, and who have an understanding of what they are talking about and it has been a great pleasure. I thank you very much. You have just closed the Conferencias Caribeñas 28. We have had 28 semesters of Caribbean lectures, uh, which is a, a sort of a record at the University of Puerto Rico. And now we're looking forward for next semester uh, to continue uh, in both the virtual and uh, the university is not going to open, so it will be uh, a virtual uh, format. Uh, it will have to be until January, uh, perhaps, or February when we start again in a, in, in a, in a physical presential form. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Thank you, everyone.